All right, well, hello. Um, my name is Kawa, and I'm a graduate student in the zoology department and a student of Dr. Hatfield. And I'm here on behalf of Drs. Hatfield and Cole um, to talk about our study here, the effects of invasive algae on larval transport into coral reefs. And the main question we're interested in is how does flow through a reef affect transport of larvae into the reef? And when you take a look at our field site here, um, this is Coconut Island right here. And there's a reef in the middle of Kaneohe Bay in which we have um, measured flow rates over um, the past few years. And um, what you can see here is um, as trade winds blow over um, the surface and the reef, uh, you can imagine that with larvae, these are the kinds of rough conditions that they're experiencing and that they're facing when they are trying to find a suitable substratum to settle and metamorphose. So um, however, uh, in in the last couple of years uh, with uh, quantifying algal cover. There has been this um, move of invasive algae um, over these coral reefs. And pictured here, you see Dictyospheria, which is a fleshy green algae, and Yukuma um, over here. And so um, what we predict, what we start asking is um, whether these algal covers would actually um, plug in, um, plug into crevices of corals and um, essentially cut off um, water flow and water circulation in the coral reef. So for management purposes, one of our hickory objectives is to determine whether punching holes in the algal cover would allow restoration of that water flow into and out of the reef. And the field methods that we used um, to take these measurements is by measuring water flow over dictyospheria mats. Um, and uh, so the mat is intact. Um, that we first start off with. And then we punch a hole into the mat and photograph them with a scale in the photo. And then we remeasure the water flow again over that hole. And then we would return every two weeks and take these measurements and photographs again. And we would do this on the windward um, reef of Coconut Island. So it takes a two-person job here um, in measuring flow. One person is underneath um, the water basically squirting dye um, for a, and watching it travel for a known distance, while the other person um, stands there with a dive slate and times that distance um, and records the data. These are the tools used to punch the holes, and we mainly use um, the largest size here, um, which has a 4.8 centimeter diameter. And this is what a typical photograph would look like um, that we would take. Here is the hole punched into the algal mat, and um, it would be labeled with a number because we would do um, several holes at a time. And finally, you have the scale there um, for reference. So what you would expect and actually see is that over time, between day 0 and day 15, for example, the hole begins to decrease in size as um, algae grows back to fill in that hole. And um, we use this analysis software at ImageJ to um, calculate the areas of the punched holes. And the advantage of the software is when you get um, irregular shaped holes like this, you can actually trace the outline of that hole and it'll be able to compute that area for you. So um, in looking at the flow data then, um, in comparing intact algae versus hole punched algae, you do see a difference. So highlighted in red here, for example, you have intact algae um, that has essentially no water flow going through that, of course, because it's just covered over. But once you punch a hole in there, um, you get a vertical net water movement, um, either going up or down. And if you were to take a closer look at the area of holes here and how that changes over time, um, what you can see is the, these are the dates um, that we've gone out to Coconut Island to um, take the measurements. And here are the number of holes um, we've punched. And um, for example, if you take hole number three, um, uh, an area of the hole that we punched um, on day one started out with 20.5 squared centimeters. And then by day 14, it's dropped down to 13.6 because al algae has grown back and filled that hole in a little bit. And so therefore, um, you get this 33.7% change in the area. Um, what's interesting is at the beginning, you do see this decrease in size when the algae fills in. But over time, actually, the holes um, actually 
um, began to tear quite a bit. So the remaining algae surrounding the hole um, began to tear, and holes can eventually collapse, and the entire algal mat disappears. Um, and so this is a long table of data that, um, that we've accumulated since July 2006 when we started this, um, this experiment. And I'm only showing you the tail end of the table right here um, that uh, comes back to our recent um, data here ending in December. And what you see here is essentially all the original holes punched in there, they have all collapsed. Um, and, uh, and the algae had essentially fallen apart from that area. Um, 11, and, uh, 11 through 13 um, were punched later. And so at least for number 12, for example, you can still see we have some data um, for that. And um, we're still monitoring that hole as well as looking for um, new algal mats to punch holes in and continue the study. Um, if you were to take a closer look at um, the relationship between area of the hole and flow rate, um, what you see if you were to take um, holes 6 through 10, for example, you get a mean, um, a decrease in area in percentage shown here and um, a mean change of 48.3% and an increase in flow rate restored um, by 1.4 centimeters per second. So um, from this data, we can conclude that punching holes in Dictyosphyria um, results in water flow um, into and out of the reef. And holes punched into the algae are rapidly filled in by algal growth that averages around 25% um, percent, um, that's filled in per week. And as, these areas of, as, as the area of the holes in the algae decreases, you actually get an increase in flow rate. Um, and finally, the main conclusion that we were able to take from the study is that eventually all the holes ended up collapsing. So therefore, punching holes can be an effective way um, to remove algal mats. Um, and so during the summer of 2006, uh, we also initiated um, two other studies. Um, the first one is the settlement behavior of the larvae of a nudibrinch, Fistilla sibogi, in a wave tank. Um, in the presence and absence of um, coral and invasive algae. And um, the second study here is um, looking at the attachment strength of planulae of Poslopora in a turbulent flow cell. And uh, as of right now, um, we're still doing the data analysis for this part. So today, I'm only going to be talking about um, the second part of the study, looking at um, attachment strength of Poslopora. And, um, so the question that we're trying to address here is when you have all of this turbulence in the flow um, with water churning about the larvae, how do they actually um, find a place to settle and actually hang on to metamorphose? And so in the current project, um, what we're looking at is the attachment strength of um, settling larvae of this widely distributed um, Indo-Pacific coral, Poslopora. This is um, our larva collector here. And this was the method initiated by Dr. Jokiel, which we adapted here. Um, and you, you can get this high-tech batter bowl from, purchased from Kmart. And essentially, you put the coral heads in here um, with flow through seawater, of course. And the coral heads, any planulae that they release, um, drifts up to the surface of the water and gets poured over the spout here into a 400 micron mesh. And that's how we collect the larvae. And um, contrary to a lot of um, larvae that we see, that we work with in our lab, that are absolutely so small, um, these larvae are actually pretty big. Um, they are 1.4 millimeters in length. And um, though their um, competence uh, varies, what we tend to find in our lab, at least, is that they do seem to be competent to settle after three days in the plankton. So um, the, the general cue that uh, essentially gets them to settle is a, a surface that's coated um, with marine biofilm um, that contains a mixture of bacteria, of diatoms. You see some filamentous algae. Um, and that's what um, induces them to settle. And so once they are ready to settle, they start to um, increase the size of this anterior or 